Jimmy Carr. So Jimmy Carr's a funny guy, and uh, I quite like Jimmy Carr. I like his jokes. I like his type of humor because it's very offensive on purpose to create a laugh. Mm -hmm. And uh, if it doesn't create a laugh, what's the point? So this is the article here, which is uh, him coming out and saying that he's on the right side of history here, which is that he slams cancel culture. He is not on the side of those insisting that people be shut down for their jokes, which is good news particularly to hear because, as I mentioned, mm -hmm. uh, I didn't hear a peep out of him when Count Dankula got charged. Yeah. I even tried to find if there was a way to contact him to see mm -hmm. if he would say something at all, because David Baddiel did, yep. Ricky Gervais did, yep. big free speech guys, and uh, Jimmy Carr was uh, touring or doing something else, I suppose, because you've got to think. if Sitting on the fence, probably. Yeah, if Count Dankula can get arrested for a joke, Jimmy Carr's definitely get arrested for a joke, mm. which is... Uh, I, I was going to tell one of his and then I realized, you know what, it's not even appropriate for this, <laughs> this podcast, so we won't. Anyway, but if you want to look up those stuff, just look up Most Offensive Jokes Jimmy Carr. You'll have a good time. Anyway, so this is him slamming council culture. So he did a uh, documentary with a group, and these are the bunch of quotes out of him. So uh, Jimmy was asked whether there were jokes he wrote 15 years ago that he would no longer perform, huh. or whether the threat of council culture had cancelled, sorry, changed the way he writes comedy during the program. A quote from Jimmy. I think cancel culture is the new book burning, he said, discussing the issue. Canceling someone on Twitter is now the new burning of their book. Mm. It is the same as someone with the Beatles record when John Lennon said, we're more popular than Jesus, and, they burning the, and they're burning the Beatles record. And I imagine and now those people feel like... I, there's, there's a P and then a bunch of asterisks, so I have no idea what he said there. So it's I don't really know, but we'll just say uh, bad people. We'll do mm -hmm. that. Right. Okay. Uh, it breaks the golden rule, which is to treat other people how you would like to be treated because we all F up. Mm -hmm. I think that's a really important point, and uh, I don't think it really gets mentioned enough. So good on, on Jimmy for making that, which is well, the golden rule is important. You mm -hmm. do want to be treated how... Well, you should treat people how you want to be treated. Yeah. And if you're going to say that there is no redemption ever for anyone who ever says anything wrong, no matter how bad then, well, okay, it was just speech. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it may have been ridiculous or, you know, absurdist or whatever, mm -hmm. but it didn't harm anyone. It's yeah, but there is, there is a slight grain of problems with, uh, with the golden rule because imagine if you're one of these cancelling leftists who never says anything interesting anyway. It mm -hmm. might be entirely consistent with the golden rule to want to burn other people's books and cancel them because you're never going to say anything interesting enough to make you worth cancelling. I was going to say, there are, of course, the Communist Party members who eventually get put up against the wall at mm -hmm. the end of the purge. Um, they're always upset that they turned out to be purged as well. But there, I have read a few accounts, especially from Orwell talking about the fact that there were some uh, Communist Party members in the Soviet Union who were carrying out the purges, and even when they were getting taken to like be shot, they were like, yeah, I deserve it. Yeah. Right, yeah. okay. That's <laughs> so, the level of mass psychosis. The, the one group that can break the golden rule, socialists. Mm. Anyway, so speaking about writing comedy in 2021, Jimmy went on to say, when you're doing a tryout show, when you're testing things out for the first time, you're a little bit nervous. It's no use me getting a sharp intake of breath on stage, that's nothing. It's no good offending people, I'm there to make them laugh. If it doesn't make them laugh first, it's gone. Mm. So yeah, he's not just because he's a comedian. Yeah, it's not about just being offensive, it's about being offensive and funny. Yes, and uh, if you're saying offensive and funny cannot happen, well then... It's point in any of this. Yeah. That's uh, point in comedy. Anyway, he went on to say about his comedy, I often say this, my show contains jokes about terrible things, terrible things that may have affected you and the people you love, mm -hmm. but they're just jokes. They're not the terrible things. Yeah. I, I, I mean, again, I mean, a million jokes about the Holocaust, he said over the years, that are hilarious. But of course, are jokes about the Holocaust or rape or anything else that he brings up, which is purpose he does mention i think it's uh, one of his shows where he did try to do the most offensive jokes just all night mm -hmm. and uh, it's a very good show right but uh he did it like in several places and then did the recording last and he said basically every single place he went to there was always one person at the end who would say that part wasn't funny in the set right one particular part yeah about, yeah, yeah and then the next show would be one person but they've got a problem with another particular yeah. part they're like could you take that out of the recording no you know go to hell because mm. all of a sudden everything's deleted mm. anyway um he also said uh, there's always been uh, shunning and people being thrown out into the wilderness and that's still happening how we do that now is on social media we say this guy's cancelled or he can't be in that pop band anymore because he did a thing Jimmy says I'm super relaxed about being cancelled because he doesn't give a toss um, well he's made his money as well hasn't he Yes, and also uh, avoided the tax, which um, oh. I'm not even mad about. <laughs> okay, <laughs> People may not know, but I mean, most people know, which is Jimmy Carr uh, was found to be avoiding tax for a while. I mean, you can see there, Jimmy Carr's a panic attack about the tax scandal <laughs> he was involved in. But I mean, tax is theft, so eh, kind of based. Anyway, so he says here, which is his reasoning for not being scared about being cancelled, 
the joke that cancels me is already out there. Yeah. It's on YouTube somewhere, and it's perfectly acceptable until one day it isn't. Mm. And he added, there's not, uh, there is not a damn thing I can do about that. Let the cards fall where they may. Which, yeah, I mean, uh, if, if they ever do come for him, uh, good luck. Mm. Number one, because he's sort of too funny to to stop. But also, number two, like his entire audience is people who are not snowflakes. Mm -hmm. So if some snowflake comes to him, you know, someone who didn't know what the name was, and then, you know, here's a joke about the Holocaust and, and pisses their pants. Mm -hmm. um, he's not going to care. No. Because you saying, I won't turn up to the next show. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to sell out anyway, so what do we see here? Anyway. So moving on. He's not the only comedian to speak out about counterculture in recent uh, week. Yep. Which, is of course there are a lot of others, which is a nice little flurry. There's always a nice little flurry every three months or so. I seem to note of uh, comedians starting to wake up, and it's getting more and more mainstream, which is nice. So you can see here, of course, uh, another one here being uh, Jack Whitehall, who says he fears cancel culture will end his career due to controversial jokes. And well, I mean, maybe, which is why I just don't engage in it. Just just cancel cancel culture. Just yeah. No, we're not going to do that. If someone says a bad joke, don't care. Mm -hmm. That's part of the process. Anyway, maybe we also have Bill Burr, who came out and said uh, he voiced an opinion against cancel culture. Again, all in this week, being uh, a quite interesting development. Sorry, this month, I should say. And uh, if we move on, we have some more. I mean, there are just loads of these. Uh, I don't know how you say her name here. Maureen Lipman? Yeah. Is that correct? Sounds cancel right. culture could wipe out comedy? Absolutely mm. true. Again, today, just coming out. And uh, it's nice to see more and more of them. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. We even have some more. So we'll just mention one more here, which is uh, Michael Sheen, who also says that it's a real danger to the entire scene absolutely is so good on him and then we'll go to john cleese because john cleese did an interview with the bbc recently and sort of blew up mm. and uh john cleese obviously not a fan of this stuff has spoken about against this he's stuff. been outspoken again on free speech issues for many many decades yes and so he's done his duty he's uh now retired and moved to i think it was nevis neves i don't know how you say it some, some tropical island right in the caribbean yeah. having a wonderful time mm -hmm. but he uh, still wants to do comedy. Mm -hmm. So he's doing some shows in Singapore or whatever, apparently. Yeah. And uh, if you're in Singapore, I mean, go and enjoy. I mean, yeah, why not? Have to get John Cleese in your backyard. So, I mean, enjoy that if there are any tickets left. And uh, the BBC called him up and were like, hey, we'd like to do an interview about your shows. Yeah, just your shows. Yeah, just what you're doing, we promise. Oh, yeah. So this is not like sle sneezy, sneaky journalism stuff at all, mm. right? Mm. No, it is. So, <laughs> they were just like, yeah, Imagine my shock. He's like, no, I don't want to talk about anything else. Just my shows. Okay, yeah, just the shows. Just the shows. Just the, It'll just be the shows, John. It's not. Anyway, <laughs> so you can go and watch the interview yourself. It wasn't that interesting, but it's just so scummy. Mm -hmm. Again, we're just like, oh, we just want to discuss this. And then immediately, this lady here, just like, so, cancel culture. <laughs> just like, uh, oh, for God's sakes. <laughs> and so it says in here that John Cleese has issued a formal complaint against the BBC because of this interview. Uh, saying that he was in, called up to the interview to discuss his stand-up shows in Singapore and Bangkok, but had instead been asked about why he was interested in cancel culture, again, repeatedly. Like, mm. they get about halfway through, he explains his position on cancel culture, and he's like, quite reasonable. Okay, fine, I have this interest because it's important, and it's killing yeah, comedy, yeah. and we need to guard against it. Uh -huh. I didn't used to have it when I was young. You happy? Right, let's talk about my shows. They do, mm -hmm. like, one question on that, and then she's like, so, um... What about cancer culture? And he's like, oh, for fuck's sake. <laughs> he, he just walks off. Good. So, Good for him. Yeah. I like it when uh, people treat the smear merchants as they should be. Which yes. Is, if you're just going to lie to me about the nature of the interview, then mm -hmm. I'm not going to take part. Go to hell. And it's classic. I remember with the, the infamous Kathy Newman, Jordan Peterson interview as well, the whole setup to the interview was very different to the interview itself, right? And yes, they had agreed to talk about political issues and so on, but they're all nice and they're on your side and they're getting your side of the story out until... The moment the cameras are on, they turn on you to try and take you by surprise, like an ambush tactic. Mm. And you should not have any time at all with for them. Like they're just smear merchants at this well, stage. You've got two options. And if quite frankly, it is, you know, you've given them the fair chance to do the thing. You've explained to them, no, I'm here to talk about X, and they just carry on with talking about Y. Mm -hmm. You've got two options. You can either just walk out like John Cleese did, mm -hmm. and everyone will side with you because you're clearly not, you know. Uh, been invited in good faith. Yeah. Or you could do what Jordan Peterson did and just sit there and slowly demolish the person yeah. over half an hour. <laughs> I mean, I've seen him talking about that and he said that she was incredibly nice to him, yeah. you know, some common courtesy, and then when the cameras were on, yeah. different personality mm -hmm. from Kathy Newman. He described it as animus possession, didn't he? Yeah. But, uh, and where is she now? Who cares? Um, she wrote a book, a feminist book. Um, she still puts in the odd article every now and again. See what I mean? Yeah. Who cares? Right. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas, where's Jordan Peterson? And, you know, still touring the world. 
you know, it's, it's he's scheduled. got that podcast now, doesn't he? Which has millions and millions of viewers, yeah. and listeners. But also, John Cleason here did mention that he was learning and reading about cancel culture and, and would like to know more. Mm-hmm. So I thought I'd just mention a, a section I have before, just in case he hasn't stumbled across it. It's happened to watch the podcast, which yep. uh, cool. When's the interview happening? <laughs> but this is on Liberty, John Stuart Mill, and there's a section in here which, again, is just kind of beautiful. That even in 1859, people are referencing cancel culture, and uh, John Stuart Mill is in here mm-hmm. in one section. Because, of course, it's not just the tyranny of the magistrate or the king or anything Mm -hmm. else. It is also the tyranny of majority. So we go to the quote. Like other tyrannies, the tyranny of the majority, society collectively over separate individuals who compose it, is means of tyrannizing, are not restricted to those acts which it may do by the hands of political functionaries. Because, of course, of the majority of Mm -hmm. society can do far worse things. Society does execute its own mandates. And if it issues wrong mandates instead of right, or any mandates at all in things in which it ought not to meddle, it practices a social tyranny more formidable than many kinds of political oppression, since, though not usually upheld by such extreme penalties, it leaves fewer means of escape, penetrating much more deeply into the details of life, enslaving the soul itself. So I think it's a funny thing, because I do I do kind of hate the uh, some of the discussion around cancel mm-hmm. culture, where it's like, oh, this is a new thing that's all of a sudden come about. Yeah, not really. You know, this has always been something you've got to worry about. The kind of all of society castigating a person. Because well, of I opinions. actually think that what John Stuart Mill is talking about here is something that's slightly different because the cancel culture that we're seeing at the moment, like where does its power come from? Who is doing it? Fundamentally, we're talking about bots on Twitter. Okay, we're talking about some real people on Twitter as well, but we're also talking about a lot of bots which are following up on trends and things and so well, on. I don't agree. I mean, there's, mm-hmm. there's, of course, it could be that all of society has an opinion and you have the opposite, mm. but it could also be that a section of a powerful part of society yes. can coerce everyone else into it, which I think you're getting at. Yeah, that's what is, I'm saying. It seems like there is this small cadre of people, like noisy direct action activists. These are the ones who are writing to your comedy club saying, eh, don't platform Jimmy Carr or whoever it might be. Sure. And it's not... That seems slightly different to what Mill is talking about because he's talking about society genuinely and openly essentially enforcing what it views as social norms on people. And that's not what's happening here where it's political activists enforcing their political will on people. Well, I think there's a there's little distinction really in the, in the realm of real uh, uh, situations because, of course, a lot of people don't engage with any of this. Mm-hmm. So say that all of society is doing, or a subsection of society, all it takes is who's got the power to force everyone else to comply. And well, the workers do have the power to comply, make people comply, as evidenced by people not getting gigs or losing their job or something. Right. I would argue that's fundamentally because of bad education about things like Twitter. It's because if a bunch of Twitter are screaming at you about something, why should that mean you should cave to what they say? It, anyway. Well, I agree, but it is the world in which we live. Mm-hmm. But uh, we can take a look at some of that as well. So, I mean, we can look at Donald Trump, for example, for because, of course, cancelling is not just people won't talk to you, giving you mm, the silent room or true. something. It is far worse, which is trying to take your livelihood away from you and destroy your life because they don't want you to, to live. They can't kill you because they're not the king. Mm-hmm. They're not the magistrate. But they, they don't have to. They don't have to. And uh, also they can do far worse, enslave your soul itself. So you can see Donald Trump here, for example, being cancelled by his bank. How does that make any sense? Yeah. Just Donald Trump not allowed to trade with Deutsche Bank. They weren't the only ones either. I think his local bank also yeah. was like, here, take your millions of dollars. Mm-hmm. We don't want them for some reason. And I love the way The Guardian frames this as they had propped up the organization for years. No, it had been their client, their customer. <laughs> <laughs> I don't right. mean it. Deutsche Bank's propping up Donald Trump. Right. If I buy milk from Tesco, Tesco is not propping up my lactose purchases. <laughs> it's a ridiculous way of framing it. But also, like Donald Trump, the President of the United States, I think he's probably got more power than Deutsche Bank at his prime than Deutsche Bank does. Well, yeah, definitely when he was president. Certainly. Except maybe it's a Reichsbank or something these days. Don't know. Anyway, but of course, it's not just losing mm-hmm. a bank. This is not only Donald Trump as well. If we go to the next one, we also have just little things. I mean, little ways of using your money. I mean, here's the bad man. Mm -hmm. I think officially bad man trademark. And there are other bad men out there that everyone is uh, forced to hate as well, in which uh, he loses his PayPal account. Mm. What's that to do? But this this is a different aspect of cancel culture, I would say, because this is discriminatory denial of service. So it's not like some. It's not usually the case in this situation that there is some business which has the undesirable as their customer, and so they the business gets pressure from activists and then cancels them. Oh, that no, does happen with this. It does happen, but mainly when it comes to place to banks, places like PayPal and that, the banks are just turning up and saying, "Well, we're political." 
we're, because of political reasons, we're not going to serve this person. And because together they constitute a monopoly, that means suddenly you can't use banks or you I, can't use food. I, I don't uh, I don't find much stock in the idea that, that PayPal or the banks have a huge interest in morals or, or politics. Yeah. I think it largely is pressure. Okay. But uh, I can see John mentioning also with uh, the bad man here, the uh, Lord Voldemort of the UK, he who shall not be named, is uh, he also lost his banks as well. All of he, them. So he's only got cash now. That's just how wow. he has to live in life. Also, in a time in which every goods and service in the UK is saying we no longer accept cash, yeah. only card, mm -hmm. because of COVID. Fantastic. Now we can literally make a class of people who can't operate yeah, in the world. We can deplatform people from money. Deplatform them from life, essentially. And, uh, well, there's, again, what mandate is this to say that a section of society don't like you, therefore you shouldn't be allowed to use money? Hmm. I mean, what is that? I mean, it's a horrific situation for us to find ourselves in, in the West. And if the CCP had done this to an individual, mm -hmm. we'd call it a human rights abuse. Well, they probably have done it as well they with have. the social credit system. Yeah. Where, it, where it's more like you can have money, it's just no one will accept it. Mm. So but it, again, it's the, the unique aspect of the West where, you know, if, if this was in the East, very easy, government just comes in and deplatforms a person's ability to use money or get a job and all the rest of it. And we're like, well, mm -hmm. that's obviously human rights abuse. It's yeah. because you don't like his politics. Yeah. In the West, no, a small subsection of elites or activists can pressure PayPal or so on and so forth to have a big long banned list mm -hmm. in which they can slowly add people they don't like and get them banned from using money. Yeah. And that's not a human rights abuse instead. Mm -hmm. That's just that's just free service. That's well that's where the whole alternative tech movement comes in, because like that's the only the entire reason for the existence of that movement is uh, is to stop this discriminatory denial of service from mm. basically ruining businesses. I'd also love to ask Elon Musk what he thinks of all this. Mm. I mean, not just the bad man, but all the rest of it. The fact that, like, how do you feel that a lot of people are banned from using PayPal? You know, the, the thing, I think he set it up. Mm. Him and Peter Thiel, wasn't, yeah. wasn't he it's also like, involved? Because they've got opinions that are quite similar to yours, Elon, mm -hmm. on some things, and they're banned from using your service, or at mm. least your old service, let's say. It's, uh, it's horrific, in yeah. my opinion. Anyway, moving on. So back to the documentary that Jimmy Carr was featured in. I did find some funny stuff out of this. And uh, so Channel 4 set this up in which they interviewed a lot of people who were cancelled and got their stories mm. and then spoke to the people who wanted them cancelled. And all of the people who wanted them cancelled look horrific. Big shock, <laughs> I must say. I mean, like, there's loads of stories in here, like the one we covered about the guy in the, uh, what was it, the Oxford Union or the Cambridge Union who interpreted Hitler. He did an impression of Hitler. And he, uh, he, he said uh, the Jews and the, uh, the N-word as well. Being, but in the character of Hitler to right. make a point. Uh -huh. And uh, there were loads of people who wanted him banned from campus for that. And it was like, he's literally saying Hitler's bad. That's the point in mm. the impression. You brainlet, but okay. So they, they looked at all that. And then they went to a trade show. And you can see the, the timestamp here. We can't play clips because it will just get copyright struck. But you can see the, uh, the timestamp here. Uh, I don't want you to play that, John, because I don't know what's going to happen there. But it's, uh, it's a, a board there showing all loads and loads of different pronouns. And uh, you might wonder what they're up to. So they set up an organization called Diversity, Inclusion, and Equality. Die, for short. Yep. They went with the die one. And they, they went to the trade show and see if they could convince major corporations of just BS. Right. And to get them to do BS. Okay. And this gets back to your point about whether or not it's uh, a section of society forcing these companies to do it. Because mm -hmm. I think this is the vector of attack in which most of this power comes from, mm. which is uh, companies being pussies. Yeah. Which just say no. Someone comes to you with a stupid idea say no, it's your money, mm -hmm. you don't have to listen to them. And uh, some of the stupid ideas they came to them with were gender-free outfits for employees. These were surf tunics. Are we talking about like North Korean Mao suits type things? No, no, tunics for like surfs. Oh, that's what it looked like. And they're like, yeah, that's a gender-free outfit. We'll give that. So we're literally going to turn your employees into surfs. Mm -hmm. A lot of companies were up for that. They, yeah, they thought that I was bet. a good idea. Yeah. They also, as you can see there, 50 different pronouns for what you a, to learn. It's a very conservative number. Only 50. It's not very many at all. And uh, they sat that, that big board there in yeah. front of a bunch of different people. They were like, yeah, sure, I can see it catching up. Yeah, I could do that in my company. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's not too difficult. It's you uh -huh. know, all for respect and tolerance and all mm -hmm. that. And then the, the two like actors turn around and say, yeah, but what if we just use gender neutral ones to eliminate any mistakes? Because this is quite a lot. So we'll delete all of them except mm -hmm. the gender neutral ones. Then everyone could be gender neutral. And all the idiot tradespeople were like, yeah, okay, yeah, I can, I can see that as well. And then they go with, yeah, what if we even eliminate them? And then we just use people's names. 
It's like, we're back to names, are we? <laughs> <laughs> and you I bet they're still <laughs> nodding along like um, gonks as well. Yeah, like yeah, Churchill dogs or something. Yeah, because like, yeah, they're like, oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> like you can oh, lay yeah. all this stuff out. And it's it, the funny thing was, the guy who even set it up was like, you know, we sat in a boardroom making up this crap. Mm -hmm. And uh, having these two actors lay out an intersectional language, mm. he could see himself nodding along almost. And he was like, wait, no, I wrote this to be stupid. <laughs> <laughs> like, you get convinced because it's just part of the uh, politically correct culture. Yes. They also said they, the last one and the kicker was they wanted 21 different toilets in your company. And this was based off 21 sexualities that they listed. So between gender fluid and demigender or whatever the hell else kinds of sexualities. And uh, yeah, again, nodding dogs mm -hmm. entirely. And uh, the best part is they even at that trade show then won an award. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's ridiculous. So the guys who sat at the trade show were handing out awards. They gave them the award for diversity and inclusion. See, actually, this is one thing I love about political correctness. Uh, it is so, it's a, such a self parody already. It's very hard to tell when someone's taken the mickey out of it. And this means that you can get people who are very based going into the diversity industry and just trolling everyone. And mm. if you are, if you're doing that or interested in that, more power to you because that sounds like great fun. At the live event, we did meet some guys, and I kind of keep mentioning them because they're so mm. cool. Uh, they work in the in the in the city, I think, and they they started infiltrating the diversity like committees, mm -hmm. and then the diversity departments over time, have, of course, got this huge amount of power to set policies and whatnot. Mm. And they're now on the boards, and they're all sat there, so they'll be like you know nine head you know blue head feminist nut jobs and them, and they'll come up with some crap. And then they're the ones who basically just like reword it so it means nothing. <laughs> so then the new policies have no effect. I'm That's like, brilliant. That is a hero. <laughs> <laughs> like that dude gives up his time to work in the most like toxic environment possible <laughs> that's legal for some reason. Yeah. And uh, just so he can defend his fellow employees. I mean, it's doing fantastic. God's work. Doing yeah. The Lord's work. But I thought I'd just uh, end this on the point, as, as Jimmy Carr points out about, you know, cancel culture is terrible. And the reason it ties in so well with this trade show is because, I mean, what is cancel culture really about in the modern age? Mm -hmm. It's about political correctness, not factual correctness. That is the difference. Mm -hmm. I mean, there, that is why there is a term political correctness. Why something is politically correct, by definition, it is not factually correct. Yes. Or you wouldn't have to say it's politically correct mm -hmm. to say X. You know, in the Soviet Union, it was politically correct to say there were no famines. It wasn't factually correct, mm -hmm. but that's the point. Mm. You know, if it was factually correct, you wouldn't need a political correct point. Sure. That point isn't made stark enough, I think. But it is obviously in here, which is it is about believing nonsense because it shows that you will comply. If you enjoyed that segment from the podcast, The Lotus Eaters, you can go to lotuseaters.com to get access to all the premium content we have on the site, such as this interview, which I did with uh, Miles Routledge or Miles of Kabul, as he is better known, or Miles of Sudan, which is here, he is currently known. God, I hope he gets back alive from that. Anyway, if you'd like to find out what happened in Kabul, go and give that a watch. And if you'd like to get updates on what's coming out on the site, you can always follow us on getter at lotuseaters underscore com. Thank you and goodbye.